there possibly be a political vision for today in the stories of the Arabian Nights? Can Edward Said's thoughts on contrapuntal interpretation and late style be applied to these fairy tales, these varieties of oriental fabulism inspired by ajajib, the Arabic term for the literature of marvels and astonishment? The Victorian translators and editors of the Nights were demolished by Said in Orientalism, as you all know, along with other orientalizing scholarly efforts. But he did also express admiration for other interpretations, above all calling the West East Divan Orchestra after the cycle of poems by Goethe. I'm going to look at some of the transformations of such oriental literature with a glance at the presence of music and writing in conjunction. But to begin with, I just want to re relate to you a little put my relationship with Edward, um, whom I met in the early 90s when we were both giving the wreath lectures. And we then discovered that we shared a childhood um, almost exactly contemporary in, in, um, in Cairo. This is Edward's father's stationery shop in downtown Cairo, now called Standard Stationery, but it had the name Palestine in it originally. And this is my father's re, um, wholesale warehouse uh, where he sold books. Um, the shop was actually on the island of Gezira. So um, we discovered that we were both, in a sense, out of place. And then in, in, we both had shared a rather extraordinary um, moment of crisis in our childhoods, which was that in 1952, his father's stationery shop was sacked in the same day that my father's bookshop was burned. And that was, those were the riots of the 25th of January, which, or the uprising, when Nasser came to power and the king was deposed. And that uprising was evoked recently in the first manifestations in, um, um, for it, it, in two years ago now for the Arab Spring. And um, so it came back with um, great historic resonance and shows the complicated um, interweaving of histories that we've been hearing about this morning. Um, so that, of course, is the cover of Out of Place. That's late style. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm going to cut a lot, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about, um, so for, to begin with, um, just a little bit of filling in, because it, it um, gives you a, kind, a narrative version of counterpoint theory. This is a very rare, um, uh, illuminated manuscript image of a storyteller in action in a courtly setting. So th that's on the right-hand side, but with a curtain, you see the, um, a scene of storytelling. The lovers are sitting on the on the dais, um, on the divan, and they and he is in the right, actually telling a, an, a, a Persian love story. But uh, the setting would give you a sense of how the oral and the written interact because he's reciting, but he won't be reciting verbatim. He will be working in counterpoint to an existing text. And you can see this in the transmission of the manuscripts of the Nights as well. There are only 22 manuscripts of the Nights, of the Arabian Nights, and many of them are fragmentary. This is one rare version in London, in the Arcadian Library, and you can see that it has been handled to bits. It's been read to bits. It's been passed from hand to hand. It's probably belonged to a performing storyteller or hakawati, um, because there are many doodles in it, and many, and also in some places there are what looks like tallies, possibly the numbers of people in the room, um, possibly him, him, I pros most likely a him, um, keeping an account of what, of how his stories are going down. I'm too close, am I? Sorry, and. Um, and I think this, the sort of ruinous state of this manuscript, and also what is re really wonderful about going to the library and seeing it, is that it actually has a very creaturely smell, um, rather like old money um, when, you, you, uh, when, you, hmm? when you when you when you when you open a wallet, and sort of the money has you know absorbed the smell of the hands from amongst it has been passed. Here you can feel this manuscript saturated with the breath of the storyteller and the hands that have. Looked, looked at it. Um, now, the, um, the, this, this living body of contrapuntal storytelling entered print for the first time. Um, it wasn't printed in Arabic before it was printed in French translation. And as you all know, the story is a ransom tale in which Shahrazad accepts the challenge 
of changing the Sultan's mind about murdering every woman in his kingdom. And in the end, she succeeds by means of storytelling, a very strong message about the role of narrative, and one that I think um, relates very strongly to what to Edward's vision of, of political literature, that literature can speak truth to power. And it can speak it in a, fable, in a fabled way. One of the first stories in the book will be very familiar to you because it's the opening of Disney's Aladdin. And that's when the genie is fished up out of the sea and let out of the bottle by the fisherman and then tricked back into the bottle. And that triggers the second phase of ransom tales because the fisherman begs to be let out of the bottle. And, I'm sorry, the genie begs the fisherman to let him out of the bottle. And the fisherman tells him a series of stories about how dangerous it is to do that. And, um, but at the end, he allows the genie out of the bottle. And he tells him this story. Uh, so, um, sorry, and he, and, so, and he lets him out of the bottle, uh, which is an example of someone trusting someone after a negotiated settlement, exactly what we were hearing this morning so eloquently from Ariela Azule. There are many such contracts between the storytellers embedded in the nights. So once the fisherman has reluctantly agreed to let to trust the jinn, Shakir, out of the bottle, he lets himself be led away by him. And after long days and nights walking beyond all known territory, they reach a lake. The genie has explained nothing of their destination, but at his orders, the fisherman casts his net and draws up a haul of fishes, marvelously colored, white, red, blue, and yellow. He's to take them, the genie goes on, to the nearby palace and offer them to the vizier for the king of that country, who will find them delicious and give the fish fisherman rich payment. I'm going to show you illustrations, but you must bear with me that I am not going to analyze them, though they need analyzing. You will have to do that for yourselves. I'm just going to accompany them with, as, as, um, as pictorial in, um, entertainment for you from the Orientalist tradition of the deluxe editions of the Knights. It turns out as promised, but then the king wants to eat more of the same fish. This time, when the vizier gives the fish to the kitchen maid to prepare, she's new, she's just arrived from Byzantium, we're told, an illusion that reflects the mingling of faiths and peoples in this imaginary city, something very strange happens. As soon as the girl starts frying the fish, the wall behind her opens and a beautiful woman appears who strikes the fish with her wand and imperiously commands them. They lift up their heads from the pan and cry out, if you come back, we shall come back. If you are faithful, we shall be too. If you abandon us, we shall do likewise. This is a very ambiguous profession of allegiance. She acknowledges it, but she gives no mercy and vanishes. The cook finds the dish utterly spoiled, the fish blackened to cinders. The king will not be put off. He demands more fish from the fishermen and gives him even more money for them. He showers him with gold. The same mysterious scene takes place, and then again for a third time. The king decides to investigate the prodigy, and together with the fishermen, they return to the lake, which neither the king nor his vizier nor anyone in his entourage has ever seen or heard, before, heard of before. But the silent lake cannot on its own solve the mystery of the multicolored fishes that swim in it. The king decides to press on further, and signaling his desire to be alone, sets off in disguise across the desert, and walks for three nights and days, until he comes upon a citadel of great might and splendor. It is eerily, utterly empty. He passes through the gates, the courtyards, the interior halls, all of them gorgeously decorated, with fountains playing, silk curtains gleaming and billowing, inlaid marble ringing to his footsteps. Not a soul. Eventually, he hears a thin, sad sound, crying from the innermost chamber. There, he finds a young man in his prime, the beautiful young prince of the country, who cannot move from the spot or rise to greet his surprise visitor. He has been enchanted, he tells his royal visitor, turned to stone from the navel down by his wife, whom he had loved with blissful love. One afternoon, he tells them, he tells the king, when he was having a siesta but missed his wife so keenly that he couldn't sleep, he overheard the chatter of the servants who were fanning him and discovered that every night 
The young wife who loved him, or so he thought, and whom he loved so much, laced his drink and then cursed him, telling his unconscious form, sleep on and may you never wake up again. How I loathe you and your whole body. When you touch me, I feel nothing but disgust. How I long for the day you'll die. The maids thought it was a crying shame, he heard them say, that their mistress would then set out to meet the man she loved and spend time with him. Later, on her return, she'd rouse her husband with a different drug so that he never knew what had taken place. So these are two, so turn of the century around that time, a bit later, illustrations of the king, the young prince telling his story, he's been turned to stone. And here is a marvelous Edmond du Lac illustration of the, of the sorceress with her, with her potions. The next night, the prince of the Black Islands spills the drugged wine so that he can follow his young and beloved wife and taking his sword reaches the place of her tryst. There he finds that her lover is a filthy slave, diseased and foul-mouthed, lying in rags on a dirty bed of straw in a disgusting hovel. From the roof, he watches her prostrate herself and promise him everything he wants slavishly until he relents and makes love to her in a sadomasochistic fashion and they fall into a lover's deep sleep. Her young husband goes mad with rage and attacks the slave, making to cut off his head, but he doesn't succeed. He leaves his rival fatally wounded, speechless and immobile. When his wife wakes and finds her lover half dead, she doesn't realize at this stage her husband is to blame for his wound. Instead, she announces that she's suddenly lost several family members and needs to mourn. For three years, she mourns dramatically, furiously, cutting her hair and wearing sackcloth. She builds her half-dead lover a tomb as if for a saint and visits him every day, weeping and praying for his resurrection. After three years of this and no sign of her lament ceasing or lessening, her husband breaks in on her devotions he has had enough. He confronts her with his knowledge of her adultery and his part in her sufferings and advances on her to kill her. This is the moment when she blasts him with her evil spells. The frozen and immured young man in the abandoned city tells the king and the fisherman. Muttering nonsense words over him, she paralyzes him from the waist down. And she then takes revenge on the whole kingdom. The young prince continues, and she turns the city and its four islands into a lake and every one of its inhabitants into colored fishes. The Muslims into green and blue fish, the Christians into white, the Jews into yellow, and the Zoroastrians into red. Laying waste to his country, turning its citizens into animals and imprisoning him in an inert body have not been enough to slake her rage for vengeance. She still comes every day to beat him with whips made of ox pizzles till the blood runs down his back, and then she throws a hair shirt over him to exacerbate the agony, all the while howling over her loss. The visiting king decides to help. He locates the tomb where the moribund slave is lying, enters it, and finishes the deed the wronged husband had begun. He then dumps the corpse in a well, and going back to the tomb, he takes the slave's place on the slab, covering himself in the slave's bedclothes, and waiting for the weeping wife to appear. When she comes as usual with food and drink for her wounded lover, he speaks to her, imitating the accents of a man of Ad, that's the pre-Islamic civilization, and she can't believe the miracle. In answer to all her prayers, her beloved has revived. Still in an assumed voice, his false double reproaches her. He would have been cured long ago, he tells her, if only she would stop tormenting her husband. In wild joy, she rushes back to the palace, mixes a spell in a magic bowl, and sprinkles the contents over her victim. The prince's stone limbs loosen and bend, and he finds himself able to move again. When she returns once more to the mausoleum, hoping to find the miracle complete, the king there, still in his convincing assumed persona, heaps her with more reproaches, telling her now that his full recovery can never happen while the city is a lake and its people fishes. Immediately, she conjures the antidote. The fishes put their head out of the water and turn back into human beings. The lake drains away, and the bustling, brilliant city with its streets and houses and markets reappears with no memory of the terrible time it has endured. The beautiful wife returns to her lover, hoping for his full resurrection, 
but finds the king himself, who throws off his disguise and runs her through with his sword and then chops her in two. After this, both kings swear eternal loyalty to each other. The young prince who was bewitched sets off on the Hajj for Mecca, but not before he's given one of the fisherman's daughters, his wife, one of his, fish, he's given one of his daughters to the, sorry, not before he's given him one of the fisherman's daughters as his wife. The visiting king who restored the city and killed the witch and her lover marries the fisherman's other daughter and makes his son the treasurer. The fisherman becomes the richest man of his time. The tale of the Prince of the Brack Islands, which is also known as L'Histoire du Jeune Homme in the best translation of the Knights, which is the French 2005, closes this first cycle of stories in the Knights. With this happy ending, it ties and knots several threads and proves the power of the ransom tale. Like much of the fantastical tale spinning of the book, this scene elude, this, this scenes elude rational analysis or construal. But as a cluster of images, the tale reprises the crucial metaphors through which the mixed culture of the Mediterranean in the medieval and early modern period struggled to understand relations between human beings, sexuality and love, liberty and license, good magic, theurgy, and bad magic, Goethe, mortality and human beings. The story offers a picture of unregenerate sorcery rooted in a dogmatic religion that insists on conformity or else degradation. There is no saving the sorceress, no ransom, no restoration for her. She is an adulteress and a dominatrix, and her act of turning all the citizens of her husband's kingdom into fish epitomizes the evil uses to which she, she puts her special knowledge. The picture of the kingdom with the different faiths coexisting in such a climate of tolerance is unusual in the nights, but it's nevertheless significant. Is it a memory or is it a fable of the Mediterranean and the Middle East as a pattern for multicultural, multi-faith society? Does the name the Black Islands catch the volcanic islands off the coast of Sicily and their lava beaches and black crags? Is that, and that of course is, is Europe, to pick up the last speaker's uh, comments about the non-European in Europe. Um, is there a memory here of the period when the Arabs ruled there and soon after them the Normans who adopted their predecessors' tolerance and scholarship, uniting Jews and Greeks and Muslims? The Prince of the Black Islands evokes a realm of differences coexisting, destroyed by fanaticism and then restored. Edward Said wanted to see the arts and literature engaged with such a history, such ideals. He looked for precedents which could serve as test cases and examples. In 1999, in Weimar, uh, sorry, in 1999, Weimar was the cultural, cultural capital of Europe, and Said and Barenboim led the idea to hold a summer school together with the cellist Yo-Yo Ma for young musicians between the ages of 18 and 25 from the Arab world and Israel. Now, I know Mariam talked about this on the first day, but unfortunately I couldn't be here, so I hope I'm not repeating too much. It was also the 250th anniversary of the birth of Goethe in 1749, the polymathic, near-mythical genius of romantic literature and science in Germany. Weimar is a small city, but huge in fame for its connections to music, to Bach and Beethoven, as well as to Goethe and Schiller. It was quite, quote, a daring experiment remembered Sir Edward Said. There was an assumption that this program might be an alternative way of making peace. It was there, he remembered, that Goethe had composed a fantastic collection of poems based on his enthusiasm for Islam. Said went on. Goethe started to learn Arabic, though he didn't get very far. Then he discovered Persian poetry and produced this extraordinary set of poems about the other, West Ostrich Divan, the West Eastern Divan, which is, this is Said speaking, I think, unique in the history of European culture. The name of the orchestra was born. It wasn't discussed further, and it has remained a resonant, mysterious, a promise of possibility. It seems a contradiction for Said, that fierce critic of European Orientalist enterprises, to choose a work that on the face of it belongs in that tradition of appropriation and stereotyping. Goethe's poems are filled with roses and nightingales, boys beautiful as the full moon, wine, women, and song. In short, lots of predictable oriental lushness. 
Orientalist lushness. Yet this imitativeness was not understood by Said as imperialist in character. Sorry, here's Goethe. And here's the title page of the, of the, of the book. Very, very, bad, very bad image, I'm sorry. Um, in an essay of 1986, where Edwards reflects on the reception of his famous critique, Orientalism, which had been published eight years before, he asked how knowledge that is non-dominative and non-coercive can be produced in a setting that is deeply inscribed with the politics, the considerations, the positions, and the strategies of power. Goethe's cycle represents for him and for us an alternative history and epistemology, presenting the history of cross-pollination that has occurred between East and West. Here was a body of Orientalist poetry that could give its name to the new orchestra. That remarkable visionary fruit of Said's last years and of his own last phase produced during his protracted struggle with death over nearly 10 years. Goethe's poems bore out the orchestra's principle that ignorance of the other is not a strategy for survival. And the DVD title, wonderful film they made of the visit to Gaza, in, no, yes, in, um, to Ramallah, sorry, in, in 2004, is called Knowledge is the Beginning. Like Seamus Heaney, who famously put the question, can poetry be strong enough to help? Said and Barenboim ask, can music be strong enough to help? In their case, the question applies more specifically to music making and the live embodied reality of the activity in real time. But it also involves a concept of the expressive lyric voice and the deep associations of that voice with identity. In his later thought, Said proposes that the arts of representation, the mimetic arts like fiction and history, yield pride of praise to a lyric expressiveness and expansion. He also asks that historical perspective, while it must not be left out of the analysis, should not pin down the literary or cultural event to a defined moment in the past, but revisit it and reclaim it to fill a new present and shape a new future. Said's approach was always historical, as you know, his life's work as a critic and intellectual was grounded in an examination of context, cultural and political. The orchestra embodies his commitment to the work of art as an actor in its time, not passive, not, not passive only, but dynamic, not a product of determining forces, but a key element in those energies and influences that give meaning to experience and shape it. The word theoria, he likes to remind us, another Greek word, comes from the Greek meaning the action of observing. For him, theory was above all an activity of critique rather than the passive reception of the observer. The theorist critic acts as an engaged participant in the work he observes because they themselves are not self-created or autonomous but precipitated in the continual process of society making and history. My position is that texts are worldly, he writes in the world, the text and the critic. To some degree, they are events, and even when they appear to deny it, they are nevertheless part of the social world, human life, and of course, the historical moments in which they are located and interpreted. The making of art and the making of music are events as well. Nor was he content to be a chronicler or analyst. Quote, the critic's task is opposition, and the celebrated essay on traveling theory ends and what is critical consciousness at bottom, if not an unstoppable predilection for alternatives? Wagner, as Barenboim insists, can be played in Israel. The loathsome views of Wagner the man need not infect the music. It can be remade for itself in a new historical context to force it to re reacquire meaning and new value as music. The establishment of the orchestra is politically heroic and anachronistic. Its existence brushes against the grain of so much in the region at the time and now, and its struggle to survive continues even more acutely today. It has been criticized, as many of you know, for normalization. However, both of its founders rather unexpectedly rejected interpreting the orchestra as a political enterprise. In his 2006 Wreath Lectures, Barenboim affirmed that the work of the orchestra was musical through and through. Although the communal involvement of playing together, he said, could figure as an allegory of unity and diversity. That was not its purpose. The West Eastern Divan Orchestra 
does not belong to community arts projects of regeneration. It is an intensely disciplined working organization that meets each year to rehearse and to learn. As Saeed writes in his book, Late Style, its ideal might be described as the will to live at ease as music in an entirely musical world. So how does Goethe's lyric cycle embody the orchestra's vision? On three levels at least, it's animated by a spirit of open inquiry towards the Arab world, grounding history in art and culture rather than state dogma and apparatus. It invites a reconfiguration, this is Goethe in, in oriental dress. <laughs> it invites a reconfiguration of individuality as mobile in a process of becoming and therefore able to change. And it embodies a concept of lyric expression that has metaphorical power to proclaim a visionary politics. First, the position of the West East Divan cycle in history. Although it's never been popular to the degree that other, Goethe's other works are, it pushed ajar a door to the East. Its publication in 1819 marks an apogee in the Oriental Renaissance, the era named by the French literary scholar Raymond Schwab in his magnificent study of that name of 1950. This book excited Said's enthusiastic endorsement. It explores how the culture and civilization of Europe was actively shaped by the encounter with Arabic, Middle Eastern, and Asian cultures in ways that have not been sufficiently explored or recognized, even when the European debt to Arabic science and philosophy is remembered. In an essay called Raymond Schwab and the Romance of Ideas, Said compares Schwab, who died in 1956, to a character whom Borges might have dreamt up. The Oriental Renaissance, that's the title of the book, above all is a virtual education in the meaning of, of intellectual adventure, Said writes. Schwab does not indict the desire to know, but it goes wrong with the desire to control and to possess. Schwab calls this dynamic the Orient as cause, and in a wonderful phrase picked up by Said, writes that enthusiasm for the East multiplied the world. He then traces the passage in the European approach to the Orient from, quote, disruptive, incredulous bedazzlement to condescending veneration. There is a saddening impoverishment, obviously, from one image to the other. Schwab is the biographer of Antoine Galin, the first translator of the Arabian Nights, a study which Edward also admired and recommended me to read. Here we find an approach to the Orient that Said could recognize and support, and which he also found embodied in Goethe's bonding himself across languages as well as across time and genre, between East and West, as the title of the cycle West East Divan conveys. Another reason for the identification lies in Edward Said's theory of contrapuntal criticism, the theme of today's talks. Goethe's Oriental masquerade projected himself into an imaginary apartness from his home territory, the counterpoint position. No exile in fact, Goethe chose to distance himself from his familiar counterpoint, compass points. He transmuted Weimar into medieval Shiraz out of a desire to be reborn, renewed in the person of Hafiz, the Persian poet whom he imitates in the West East Divan. In a sense, Oriental disguise was a private necessity for Goethe impersonating an unfamiliar exotic alter ego, accompanied by a form of creative throwing of the voice, acts as a literary analog to musical counterpoint. Rethinking, rethinking in a continual um, a series of relationships. Brownboyne picks up Said's thinking about contrapuntal criticism when he writes, quote, just as it violates the principle of counterpoint in music to emphasize one voice while excluding all the others, so Edward believed it impossible to settle a conflict, political or otherwise, without involving all parties concerned in the discussion of a solution. The same could be said of the principle of integration, applicable to all sorts of problems from acoustic balance in an orchestra to peace talks in the Middle East. It's interesting to see in action in this passage the quasi-magical operation of metaphor as action, the principle of language instituting reality words becoming flesh. Oriental masquerade had been the height of fashion throughout the 18th century, on the stage, in fiction and fable, as well as in philosophy and politics, 
Montesquieu in Lettre Persane is one of the most famous examples, uses this device, the viewpoint of the foreign visitor, and Voltaire's Serbic Oriental court provide an obvious instance of the West putting on Eastern dress in order to examine itself more clearly and skewer iniquities at home. In certain specific matters, Voltaire also chose to dramatize other civilizations' laws and customs, not only to lambast the West, his own territory, but to point the way to needed social and medical reforms along the lines discovered in the Orient. The literary maneuvers of impersonation and masquerade involved many later significant European writers in Eastern mimesis, also directly inspired by Oriental culture. Mozart's Così fan tutte, which I'll come to next, is only one example among hundreds of such performances, some comic, some earnest. Edward loved and admired the opera Così fan tutte, the last collaboration of Mozart and the brilliant librettist Lorenzo da Ponte, which was first performed in Vienna in January 1790. The opera stages very knowingly and farcically an oriental masquerade. When Don Alfonso devises a bed trick, um, sorry, I just need the other computer to be on. Is it on? Is it on? I don't think it's on. Sorry, can you, can you come? Thank you. Um, um, where are we? No, it needs to. Um, when Don Alfonso devises a bed trick for the two young men to play on their fiancés, Dora, Dora Bella and Fior di Ligi, they will disguise themselves as Orientals and test the young women's steadfastness. When they reappear in their masquerade, the word is often used in the opera, the maid Despina, who is in Don Alfonso's conspiracy to test the young women's loyalty, instantly draws attention to the new visitor's appearance, commenting in horror at, in pretend horror at their outlandish moustaches. These afford lots of happy stage business and opportunities for designers, of course, but they're also a mark of the stranger, Europeans at the time being clean shaven. Despina introduces the idea that they must be from the Ottoman Empire, from the Balkans or from Turkey. Later, their identity in the opera settles down as Albanian. And in many ways, again, one would expect Said to find the device demeaning and orientalist in the worst possible taste. But once more, his critical thinking brushes against the grain, and he draws attention to the doubts the libretto casts on stable identities and the perplexing volatile shifts in the character's emotions. His keen interest in the idea of fluid configurations of the self, as explored by some of his favorite writers, returns again and again in his thoughts on late style, which is marked by a turn away from moral gravitas direct advocacy and unified subjectivity. It involves a degree of letting go, of giving rise to unexpected changes of direction, to inconsistency, experiment, marvel, anachronism, and anomaly. Don Alfonso devises a game, Said writes, in which human identity is shown to be as protean, unstable, and undifferentiated as anything in the actual world. In a splendid comic aria, stuffed with amorous innuendo, Guglielmo asks the two women to admire him. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, it's a delicious mock serenade, which interestingly reverses the normal direction of the singer's praises. Guglielmo, joined later by Ferrando, vaunt their own charms, not the beauty of their love objects. And beneath the froth and wit and lively mischief, the scene actually stages a double demand for recognition. The song asks the young women to look at the Orientals, not at their prejudice against their unfamiliar features, those moustaches. And of course, it asks them to assess them for themselves and see through the disguise to the true lovers beneath. In some ways, it even gives them voice at their own self-estimate. The women, of course, fail, but in doing so, will come to realize their ignorance and indeed their prejudice. Recognitions of this kind underlie the movement of fairy tales. Cinderella seen for who she is, not the slattern she's cast as, and in some ways, Cosi also plays with oriental masquerade to warn that one should never trust appearances, not because they are deceptive, but because they become burdened with prejudicial baggage. Sa Said chose to see past the light malice of the opera's ideas about the ways of all women and the farce about exotic strangers, and suggest instead that the opera offers a deeper insight into human character, for what then ensues in Cosi leads to a deeper state of recognition. This is what Shahrazad is also doing in the nights. She's illuminating to the Sultan and through the Sultan to us the structures of prejudice and preconception. The Albanian disguises of the fiancés triggers out of character behavior in the two young women. They fall for oriental seductiveness even when play acted. Da Ponte and Mozart project a modern understanding of the self as changeable in relation to others rather than atomized. Identity does not possess fixed integrity but alters as elective affinities work metamorphoses upon it. In the introduction to Mimesis, there's a significant epigraph from the Colombian novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Human beings are not born once and for all on the day their mother gives birth to them, but that life obliges them to give birth to themselves. I think that's what we heard very strongly in Ariela's talk this morning, this idea of giving birth to yourself by adopting another language, another story that is composed of both history and future. And actually, Paul yesterday said that we all um, carry a piece of the Congo in our pockets. And of course, that certainly applies to my colonial background. But it also seems to me that that idea that you engage with that to give birth to yourself in another form um, is the crucial Saidian position. That life brings with it experiences which form that self-originating, encounters and sympathies, projections and masks. Again and again, in his thoughts on late style, Said is concerned with just such dissolutions of the self through instability, polyvocality, plurality, and internal inconsistencies and discordance. This line of inquiry also reflects the work of playing together in concert, the dissolving of identity into a radiating wheel of different compass points, interconnectedness across time and geography. Goethe's own oriental impersonation, which culminates in the West Eastern Divan 29 years after Cosi's first performance, invites his readers to imagine a similar emancipatory change, a psychological projection out of self into another. In his, um, self, um, in his self obliteration, Goethe sinks himself into the being of Hafiz, the Persian poet who reveled in song and love and drink. And this is a characteristic, a marvelous Persian illumination of um, drunkenness, in, including heaven. At the top, there's heaven where the angels are drinking. <laughs> Rather different view of Islam from perhaps we are hearing sometimes. Um, um, and if, it's as if he sounds as if he wants his readers to imagine not that he's originating the poems, but rather channeling them. He presents them as a form of translations and reinscriptions, though they actually are originals, but, um, but he's, he, he's pretending to be Hafiz. Through, his, through this tribute, he takes his culture into self-dissolving relation with the Oriental tradition, in which lyric poetry, with or without music, dominates. In the Oriental Renaissance, Raymond Schwab declares, 
Oriental literature seeks to transform everything, including words, into musicality. A, musical, a musicologist, Stetkevich, in a fine essay on early Western variations on Arabic literature, echoes the same thought when he says that Goethe opts for the song, for the validity of the lyrical, for the expressive against the mimetic. As both Barenboim and Said always repeated, making music with the West Eastern Divan Orchestra is an act of difficult courage and defiance, not an irenic love-in, and Hafiz, it turns out, makes a curiously compelling presiding genius. The representations of song in Goethe's poems after Hafiz finds echoes in the exchanges of storytelling in those narrative, those live narrative metamorphoses. I think I'll just skip a bit more about Safis and then. Um, um. So passionate lyric is usually considered a game for the young, and Goethe was old, being in his 60s, was old in 1814, though I don't accept that anymore. Um, on Saidian principles, age itself is being changed by history. However, in the same decade of his life, Edward was terminally ill with leukemia, and that's when his thoughts turned to the effects of lateness, the waiting room of death, as Paul called it yesterday. For him, late style is not bounded by simple chronological or biographical facts. For Goethe, it's a way of, th for Said, it's a way of thinking and making, composing and writing, filled with that productive anachronism, anachronism and anomaly. It can also bring a newly discovered freedom of speech, renewed courage in risk-taking and experiment, and open the mind to a vision of human potential for productive change. The arts play a crucial part, he maintained, in creating and fostering historical memory in the foundation of a nation state. And his argument grows in force when taken with Paul Gilroy's book, Darker Than Blue, on the moral economies of the black Atlantic. Here, music plays a crucial role in the forming of social ethics. In Eloquent Indignation, Gilroy points out how the wholesale privatization of culture transforms the mechanisms of social memory. And he sets out a powerful critique of cultural commodification and the damage it does to the sense of groups, their history, and consequently their identities. His line of argument illuminates the work of the West Eastern Divan Orchestra. Gilroy places music, and most especially live music, performed to live audiences at the forefront of the struggle to forge mutual cultural expressions that supersede individual interests and political antagonisms. He has a concept in the book that he calls responsible troubadours. The time in which they play and perform is that time of the not yet, the time sung by the blues, which Gilroy invokes as the perspective of ethical art. The pursuit of an alternative future, he writes, necessitates the cultivation of counter-memory. Even time loses its power when remembrance redeems the past. Music, like the love songs and elegies in the nights, doesn't convey meaning in the referential form of discourse or argument, but music, song, and other forms of literary music convey feelings which have a history of connection to struggle, identity, and the sense of, the belong of belonging. Mahmoud Dawish wrote, we have a country of words. We travel like other people. Music can be a country too, and, in, and, it, and that in literature, and that in lit, music can be a country, a country too, and in literature, lyric is music's closest counterpart. It possesses analogous properties in relation to time and motion, vital signs in Said's vision of culture. With his intransigent allegiance to the sovereign demands of the aesthetic, and to the potency of the expressive, Edward Said, in his own late style, argues in a bleak, difficult way back to politics, specifically to a politics of culture where contradictions coexist, as in the Arabian Nights. As the Arabian Nights, Ajaib, the literature of the marvelous, and along with other works of Arabic in that form, in Arabic of that form, dramatized with such irrepressible energy. Thank you.